Good day, everybody. Welcome back. This is going to be Chapter 7, Part 2. We are continuing our discussion about the functional organization of the nervous system. Um, now, during our last conversation, we finished looking at the three main regions of the brain. And what I want to do now is I want to quickly talk about the cortex. And then I also want to kind of introduce you to the homunculus. And then we'll take a look at the autonomic and the motor nervous system. Now, the outer layer of the cerebellum is covered by the cortex, and the cortex basically is the ability or the region where you're able to integrate and interpret a lot of the sensory information, and also some of our voluntary movements will be initiated within this particular location. Um, we see that in some of the lower vertebras, the cortex has taken over a lot of the functions of the midbrain, whereas in um, higher level vertebras, it will definitely play a role in our ability for concentration, reasoning, and thinking. Now, when we're talking about the cortex, what we're basically taking a look at are the different folds and grooves that you see on the outer surface of the brain. So go ahead and take a look at the picture that is on the right-hand side, and you can see the gyri, which are the folds, and you can see the sulci, or sulcus in singular. These are the grooves that we see that are being made on the brain surface itself. And it turns out that the folds are extremely important because as we are making more and more gyri, or more of the gyrus folds right here, what we're doing is we're increasing the surface area of the cortex. And there's a corresponding relationship with the fact that if you're able to accommodate more surface area, you're able to recruit over more neurons and synaptic connections between them, which usually leads to a higher level of function and complexity between organisms, um, within the organism itself, excuse me. In fact, I want to go ahead and show you a comparison. So the picture that you're looking at here is of a sea lion brain. And if you were to pull up a human brain, you would also see a high amount of folds and grooves that are on surface. And like I said, it helps us with anything from interpreting our sensory information, the voluntary movements, to items as complex as critical thinking, reasoning, um, and concentrating, right? So we want to have lots of folds because we want to have lots of surface area, lots of ways for our neurons to interact. So go ahead and take a look at the sea lion brain one more time. Very similar to what we have, lots of curvations, lots of grooves. And then I want to go ahead and show you what the hedgehog brain looks like. Here you go. Nice and flat and smooth surfaces. So even if you were to come across an organism that has a brain relatively the same size, one of the ways that you can explain why the intelligent levels might not be the same or the complexity might not be the same could obviously be to say, well, you don't have the same amount of synaptic connections, but now you can also add to the fact that if the cortex isn't as highly folded as we would expect it, that means that it has less surface area for those neuron interactions to occur. In fact, what we can see happening is based on our knowledge of the cortex, we can go ahead and divide the brain into the cortical lobes. And when you look at the names, you're going to notice that they're very similar to the bone names from when you learned your skull, uh, your skull bones. So we're going to have a frontal lobe that corresponds with our frontal bone, which is by our forehead. And towards the side, we're going to have the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe will be by the temporal bone, which basically corresponds where your ears are. And then towards the back, we're going to have our occipital lobe um, that's taking care towards the back area of the cerebrum. Now, each area will be designated for specific functions. So on your PowerPoint, what I've done for you is I've just kind of highlighted some of the main ones. So for instance, um, your ability to reason, to plan, and a little bit of your speech ability comes courtesy of the frontal lobe. Whereas if we look at the parietal lobe, that one will be more concerned about doing um, orientation, um, movement, recognition, and perception of different stimuli. The occipital, um, a 
lobe is all about visual processing. And then if we take a look at our temporal bone, we see that over there, surprisingly to no one, we have auditory stimulus. We have auditory response, obviously because the ears are located in that section. But also what we see happening is that it will allow us um, for to assist us, I should say, excuse me, with our memory as well as some of our speech patterns. Um, in fact, in lab, we do this activity where we're able to kind of graph which regions of the brain um, are assisting us with some of our sensory system. And what we can do then is we can create almost like a little um, top, uh, topology or topical graph of which nerves correspond with, with actions or sensations. So here, for instance, we can do a topiology, which is that we're finding out exactly which region of the cortex corresponds to a specific body. And what we see happening is that um, there will be a correspondence to the size of the region and the importance of the body part that it's governing over. Areas of the body that are extremely important will often have a larger size of the brain dedicated to it, um, which means that there are more neurons, more inter uh, synaptic connections, which means that there tends to be more sensitivity in that particular region of the brain. In fact, if you've ever heard of a homunculus, this is one of the ways that we can represent the importance of certain regions of the body corresponding to the overall size of the brain that's located to it. Um, here you can see the human body in its normal proportion, and then you can see his homunculus. And what you're going to notice is that certain areas, like primarily the face, the lips, the hands, and the feet, they are extremely enlarged. And basically what the homunculus is telling us is that the larger the area is drawn, the more of an area in the cortex has been dedicated to that particular section of the body. Our other example is that of the mole. We could see right here, uh, moles tend to go ahead and burrow with their nose to kind of explore their environment and look for things like food. So what we see happening is that a large section of their cortex is dedicated to neurons that guard over the nose and are able to interpret the sense of uh, the sensory information that's received. So if we were to do a homunculus, we're going to notice that the nose part has been exaggerated in size as well as the hands that are utilized for digging. Um, if you are joining us for the lab section of comparative animal physiology, you will have the opportunity to do a homunculus. Um, and part of what you'll do is you'll take certain measurements of the body to see which ones are less or more sensitive. And then based on the data you, you collect, you can go ahead and input that in. There's lots of different websites that are available. One will be provided for you. You will input your data and it will go ahead and give you a nice homunculus drawing so you can kind of see which areas are exaggerated. And if you are not in the lab but you would still like to do a homunculus, um, just go ahead and send me an email and I'll be happy to share the directions with you so you can kind of play around with it and um, collect your own data set. Now that we have kind of perused through the brain and we've become more familiar with the sensory aspect, um, we've taken a look at the different parts of the brain and what they overall contribute to. What I want to do now is I want to focus more on the efferent branch of the peripheral nervous system, meaning um, how your body will be responding based on what the integrating center tells us that we need to do. Um, this is where the efferent neurons are communicating with the effector organs, right? And it turns out that when your body goes ahead and determines on a course of action, you Usually that's either going to involve the activation of what we call the autonomic nervous system or the somatic motor nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is under involuntary control, meaning that you can't consciously control the effects of it. Um, it is divided into three main categories. You have your sympathetic nervous system, your parasympathetic nervous system, and your enteric nervous system. Now, hopefully many of you remember the sympathetic uh, nervous system and parasympathetic one, but most likely you remember the sympathetic from our discussion with the endocrine chapter when we talked about the whole fight or flee scenario and the fact that the sympathetic nervous system is the one that gets us all hyped up and is usually activated during areas 
of stress as well as physical activities, and we feel our body being flooded with epinephrine and cortisol. We also feel that our heart rate starts to increase, our breathing rate speeds up, um, and we just have this feeling that we either want to fight or we want to flight. So we have that hyped up feeling. Well, the parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite of that. It's the antagonist of the sympathetic nervous system. This one is usually involved um, with calming down, with returning you back to your homeostatic or basal rates. The parasympathetic nervous system is often involved with resting and digestion. So it's part of why after you have a nice large meal, oftentimes we feel a little bit sluggish. We don't really want to do a physical activity. We might just want to eat either take a nap or just kind of sit down and take it easy. And that's because the parasympathetic nervous system is directing the majority of your blood flow to your digestive system. So it can extract the nutrients out of the food, thereby depriving the skeletal muscle of some of the blood, making it a little harder to do a physical activity, even if we wanted to. So the sympathetic hypes you up and the parasympathetic calms you back down. And then the enteric one, this one is completely different from both of them. It acts independently. The enteric autonomic nervous system is more pertaining to the digestive system. It talks about the fact that um, when you are consuming a meal, the process of moving the food through the esophagus into the stomach and into the small intestines can be completely controlled by the enteric nervous system. It does receive inputs from the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, but it can also independently focus. Um, the enteric nervous system you'll learn more about in a few chapters when we take a look at our digestive system. Um, for now, I really would like to focus more on the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Now, as I mentioned to you before, the sympathetic and parasympathetic can be explained as antagonistic. And that's because one will tend to stimulate where the other one tends to inhibit. And we see that the majority of the organs in the body are able to receive input from both. So it's a prime example of a dual innervation, meaning that both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic will have an effector organ, um, will have an effector neuron dedicated to that particular part of the body. So for instance, the sympathetic one will cause the heart rate to increase, where the parasympathetic will cause the heart rate to decrease. Um, you can have bronchial dilation because of the sympathetic and bronchial constriction because of the parasympathetic. So they're both able to have their input and oftentimes, as I said to you before, they'll have opposite effects. Now, it is very important to point out that they are extremely essential to maintaining our homeostasis. And what we see happening is that both of them will coordinate together to establish what we call our basal tone. So our basal tone would be our numbers or our settings under the resting conditions. So for instance, um, the heart tends to beat every 0.8 seconds. Um, that is the normal basal tone for many of us. Um, and that is because both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic will provide their input to figure out what is best for our overall body health. Now, there will be some um, similarities, and there will also be some differences in how the communication pathway will be different between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So what I want to do is I want to kind of show you how the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system become involved when you activate both of these. So let's go ahead and start off with the similarities, and that's going to be the pathway that needs to be followed to activate either system. This this pathway will always evolve um, at least two neurons. You will have a preganglionic neuron, and I'm going to highlight it for you right over here. The preganglionic neuron will be housed in the central nervous system, and it will communicate with the postganglionic neuron that is located in the peripheral nervous system. And the postganglionic neuron is the one that will directly communicate with the effector organ.
Okay, so regardless if you're looking at the sympathetic or the parasympathetic response, you will see that the pathway that they use to communicate within the neurons will start off in the central nervous system with the preganglionic neuron, and it will then go ahead and cross over to the peripheral nervous system where it will communicate with a postganglionic neuron. And this postganglionic neuron will have the effect on um, the ultimate organ or whatever effect you're trying to stipulate. I also want to point out that the connection point, uh, the synapse between the pre and the postganglionic neuron, is going to be termed the autonomic ganglia. So the autonomic ganglia right here, and if we come back to our illustration, you're going to notice that they have drawn almost like a little halo around the ganglion so you can see that that will then be the connecting point between pre and post ganglionic neuron okay so this is the similarities the pathway is the same you have the two neurons central nervous system for one peripheral nervous system for the other and you have your ganglion that's connecting both of them now let's look at the differences all right, so there are four differences. I know I've numbered three of them, but there's four of them that I want to point out. The first one is just based on um, uh, location. It turns out that if we take a look at the preganglionic neuron, the location in the central nervous system will be different for the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So if I come over here and I take a look at my preganglionic neuron and compare it to my sympathetic versus my parasympathetic, both of them are in the central nervous system, but exactly where will differ. So if I come over back to my left-hand side, it says right here that my sympathetic um, autonomic pathway or my sympathetic nervous system, it will utilize the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord for the preganglionic cell body location, whereas the parasympathetic response will favor the hindbrain and the sacral region of the spinal cord. So just locational-wise, the preganglionic cell bodies will be located in two different spots within the central nervous system. Speaking of location, it turns out that the ganglia, you know, the connecting point between the pre- and the post-ganglionic neuron, its location will also differ. In the sympathetic nervous system, we're going to notice that it tends to be closer to the spinal cord. So let's go over to our illustration and notice that they've drawn the little halo for you. And the halo has been drawn that the distance is a little bit shorter between the preganglion versus the postganglion. In the sympathetic nervous system, if you look at that picture, find your little halo. There's my little ganglia. Notice how it's closer to the effector organ in this case. So if we look at our text, it says in the parasympathetic setup, the ganglia location is closer to the effector. So sympathetic closer to the spinal cord, uh, parasympathetic closer to the effector. The third difference is going to be um, how widespread the response is going to be. So what are the numbers of postganglionic neurons that will be activated? And it turns out that the sympathetic will have a much wider effect than the parasympathetic. And part of that corresponds to the fact that the sympathetic is all into hyping and increasing and amplifying the response. So usually what we see happening is that from a postganglionic neuron aspect, postganglionic neuron, the sympathetic nervous system will be able to activate 10 or more, whereas the parasympathetic will do three or fewer. So it's a very specific, very localized type of response. Now, what is the fourth difference? Because I said to you, there are four differences to look at, right? And the fourth difference is going to be all about the neurotransmitter that the postganglionic neuron releases in order to communicate with the effector organ. In the sympathetic nervous system, the postganglionic neuron is going to release norepinephrine. So that's indicated right here by your NE. Norepinephrine is what's going to be released. In your parasympathetic nervous system, we're going to rely on acetylcholine, ACH. Acetylcholine will be the neurotransmitter that's released by the postganglionic neuron in order to communicate with the effector organ. So that is the fourth difference. I didn't write it out, but I definitely highlighted it on your picture to kind of draw your attention to it.
I also want to point out that there are some locations in the body that are only able to receive um, innervation um, or information from the sympathetic system, which means that it can only create more of an amplified response. Um, part of these will include the adrenal medulla. This kind of makes sense because as you might recall from our previous conversation, the medulla is full of chromaffin cells, which are modified neuron cells, so it's easier for them to communicate with the preganglionic um, sympathetic neuron system. Um, we also see, for instance, that the sweat glands will only have sympathetic innervation, and that will basically means that when it responds, it will always respond in producing um, the cooling mechanism of sweating. We see that the erector pili muscle falls in this category. That's the muscle in humans that gives us goosebumps. In other animal models, like in your cats and your dogs, it's the muscles that basically fluff up the hair to make it look like they're larger. Um, it's supposed to be a defense mechanism. Um, and also the kidneys and most of your blood vessels fall in this particular category. Another item that we should talk about since we're on the topic of the autonomic pathway are going to be autonomic reflex arches. Um, and what we see happening with the reflex arches is usually in most scenarios, um, when you want a response from the brain, the integrating center will have um, a very organized mechanism to figure out which effector organs need to be affected and exactly what the degree of um, response will be. When you do a reflex, we see that we do not involve those different conscience centers of the brain. Instead, what we tend to do is we tend to utilize the reticular formation. Um, so we basically come up with a way to have a quick response, and the response will always be the same as long as the threshold of the stimulus is met up. So there's no overanalyzing. It will just be a consistent response that you'll see over and over again. And and this automatic response is then an example of a reflex. Now, the other way that we can get our effector organs to react is going to be the somatic motor pathway. The somatic motor pathway is our voluntary nervous system response. And the reason we call it that is because it will solely have control over our skeletal muscle. Um, I do want to point out that there are some um, the, uh, there are some reflexes that come into play here as well, and obviously those will be a different category, but we'll talk about that later. For now, we're just going to keep it nice and simple for the somatic motor pathway and just concentrate on the fact that it has full control of the skeletal muscle, and the cerebrum will be the one that will kind of um, analyze the result and stipulate the effector organ of the skeletal muscle. Now, what I've done for you is I've highlighted seven items for you on this particular slide, and that basically highlights the differences between the somatic motor pathway and the autonomic pathways that we were discussing before. Um, the first difference, which is a really big one, is the fact that it can only affect one effector organ, and that would be the skeletal muscle. The second difference between the motor pathway and the autonomic pathway is that the cell bodies of the motor neuron are all located within the central nervous system, um, never outside of the central nervous system. Um, so they don't have to be within the ganglia. They're always within the CNS region. They are monosynaptic, um, meaning that you'll have one synapse between the central nervous system and the effector organ. And in order to accommodate that, we do see that the axons tend to be very long and they'll extend all the way down to the muscle. Some axons will actually extend all the way from the top of the brain down to the tippy toe. Um, and this can be done by, of course, elongating the axons. Another one is that the axons will split into the axon terminals, um, which is basically what we see when we look at our neuromuscular junction. This is a very um, specific junction, a very specific cluster um, compared to in um, the autonomic nervous system. Most of the times what we see happening is that you tend to have more like a, a string formation of varicosities.
Um, another one, number five, is that when communicating, the neurotransmitter that is utilized in the somatic motor pathway will always be acetylcholine. Whereas we just pointed out in the autonomic nervous system, you can choose from acetylcholine or norepinephrine, depending on if you're doing the sympathetic or the parasympathetic activation. Um, last but not least are the last two, and then one of them is uh, basically piggybacking of number four, which talks about the neuromuscular junction. Well, that little synaptic cleft, that meeting point, it is very narrow, which allows for rapid communication between the neurons and the muscle. And last but not least, there is no option in either having an amplified, <coughs> excuse me, or a calming reaction. If you're activating the somatic motor pathway, all your muscle cells will always respond by becoming excited. So they will start depolarizing, inducing their action potential, and they'll ultimately contract. Whereas in the sympathetic and parasympathetic, they are basically antagonistic because one hypes you up and the other one calms you down. I also want to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about animal behavior. Um, basically, it falls into three categories. We can go ahead and pick up our conversation again about reflexes. Remember, reflexes are involuntary. As long as the threshold stimulus is met, you'll always get the same response. We also want to talk a little bit about the central um, pattern neurons that will be involved in rheumatic behavior. So when we're doing our things like um, walking, like our locomotion, um, breathing, or in the example, we're going to see swimming motion. And then we also have to talk about probably the most complex and diverse behaviors that we're able to have due to the nervous system, and that will be voluntary behaviors. And this can be anything from um, mating to fighting um, to being able to comprehend skills such as reading and writing. All right, now right over here, you're looking at a reflex arch, and this is going to help us explain our reflex behaviors. And basically what we see with reflexes is that they tend to be a very simplistic response compared to the rest of the things that the nervous system can accomplish. And it usually at the bare minimum needs to involve two neurons. You need to have an afferent and an efferent. And if we go ahead and look at the left hand side of our slide, what we see is an example of a monosynaptic relationship where you have your response coming in or your stimulus coming in through the afferent sensory neuron, and it's then automatically communicated with the efferent neuron. There is no conscious control centers in the brains that have to be recruited to figure out what can get done. You will automatically get a response based on the receptor that was activated. And as you can see, you will go from afferent to efferent, and you will get the output and the effect that you're looking for automatically. So this is as simple as when you put your hand on a hot surface, your brain doesn't need to analyze the fact that it can be dangerous. It will automatically um, activate the reflex where you will draw your hand back. Um, we also see, for instance, and this, is one, this one's a little bit more complicated, um, if you go in for your physical and the doctor taps right below your patella, right below your knee, um, yeah, your knee, you'll get the jerk reaction where you just go kicking your leg. That's another example of activating um, a reflex. You can also have multiple neurons interplay together. This will be a polysynaptic relationship. And you can find that one on the right-hand side of your illustration where you can see that you have your stimulus coming in through your sensory receptor and you're activating your afferent neuron. But in this case, your effector neurons will be multiple, meaning that you have more than one. So in the case of that, you will definitely need to have a little relay and that is where your interneuron will perfectly come into play, allowing you to connect one afferent to multi multiple efferent neurons.
We also see that you can do, uh, when you're looking at your reflex arches, so your connection between your receptor um, and your effector, you can go ahead and have what they call convergence and divergence, and it will all depend on how the neurons are arranged. So in convergence, which is my top picture, we see an example of spatial submation, which basically means that you will have multiple afferents neurons that will all feed into the same effector <coughs> neuron. If you're doing your divergence, then you're going to flip the relationship. And in the divergence, what we see is that the activation of one receptor and one afferent neuron can go ahead and have an amplifying effect because it will activate several effector organs by activating several of the efferent neurons. So this one tends to um, often involve multiple processes that are activated by one single stimuli. Now looking at rhythmic behaviors, what we see happening is unlike the reflex with the rhythmic behavior, we are going to have to rely on a group of neurons and these are going to be called our pattern generators. They're called pattern generators because once they're initiated, they will always have the same pattern that they will develop. Um, and that basically sees that they often are able to self-sustain their depolarization mechanism um, independent from any additional sensory input. So all you really need to do is you need to get them activated and you'll consistently get the same rhythmic response. Now the pattern um, can be initiated either internally or externally from the cell. If we see that the cell is able to spontaneously depolarize, then oftentimes we're looking at a pacemaker cell. Pacemaker cells, as you might recall from our previous conversations, they are the ones that tend to have a very fluid um, resting membrane potential, means that it's very easy for them to be excited, and they're usually the first one in the bunch to become depolarized and establish an action potential that will then quickly spread across um, either a bundle of cells um, or an entire organ, depending on the location that they're at. If we see that within the network itself, um, the rhythmic polarization will occur because of how the neurons are relayed in a network, so not just one, ne one neuron, then we have an example of emergent properties. So this basically means that instead of relying on one single cell, you will rely on a group of cells to simultaneously depolarize and spread that excitation, um, thereby causing your behavioral pattern to start being consistently generated. Now, what you can do is you can go ahead and take a look at the example that's at the bottom of the screen, and it all talks about leeches and how we can get the leeches to swim in a very rhythmic pattern. And if leeches aren't your thing, well, then you can go ahead and think about movements like chewing um, or even walking. All of those will fall within this rhythmic behavior. Now, really quickly, just take a peek at the graph, and it basically shows you that what you're doing is that, once again, you're going to have to rely on activating the mechanoreceptors. Um, you will often use some interneurons to connect the afferent over to the brain. And what we see happening here that is most important that's going to set the reflex, um, I'm sorry, that's going to set the rhythmic behavior apart from the reflex behavior is the fact that you will activate those group of neurons that are dedicated to their central pattern generation. And once you activate those, then what we see is that you will continuously have the same response that will occur. So in the case of the leech, the side-to-side -side movement as it glides through an aquatic environment. Now, as I said, if you're not into the leeches, that's perfectly fine. We can take a look at our locomotion pattern. So basically the movement from front to back as we start initiating the swing gates. Um, and what we see happening here is that when we get up and we start walking around, um, we see that our brainstem, primarily our pons and our medulla, will be the one that will initiate the central pattern generators and will be the ones that can regulate the speed that kind of starts it off.
all of us have a different speed that we walk at, you know, at our normal relaxed pace. This is all regulated by the brain stem. The central pattern generators itself are located within the spinal cord. And one thing that I definitely want to point out to you is that even though you have the locomotion that you create, that's the same pattern over and over again, we do see that it's able to adjust the speed and the direction of the movement because if you look at your chart at the bottom, you're going to notice that it's able to receive sensory feedback. So as your brain is activating these neurons and you're doing your swinging gates of walking one step in front of the other, what we see is that our sensory input will alert the brain if, for instance, there's an obstacle in front of us or if there's a turn coming up or if there's a change in elevation so that we can adjust our pattern slightly so that we don't, you know, fall to the floor. So modifications are possible. And then last but not least, I don't think we can do a nervous system lecture without talking about learning and memory, right? Um, very important, especially when you're trying to make your way through uh, comparative animal physiology in only six weeks. So there is quite a difference between learning and memory. Um, learning by definition basically means that you are um, acquiring, I was going to say learning, um, you are acquiring a new skill or some new information. Um, memory means that you're able to retrieve that information and the length of time that you are able to retrieve that, that will differ if the memory is immediate, short term or long term. All of this will be dependent on the plasticity of the synaptic connections between the neurons. This is why it's so important that as you continue on with your life experiences, you always continue learning because it turns out that the more active you keep your brain, the easier it is for these new synaptic connections to form, making it um, an all-time um, easier task to keep learning and memorizing things from the beginning to the end of our lifetime. Now, they've done lots of studies on invertebrate learning and memory patterns, and most of these studies involve the use of sea slugs. And what they see is that the sea slug is able to go ahead and come up with a simple kind of learning called habituation. And habituation basically means that if you are exposed to a stimulus um, repeatedly, um, you will slowly start to see a decline in the response. So let me give you an example of what they did. So in the experiment, and you can obviously read more about this in the chapter PDF files, um, what the experimenter did is that they basically went and they got their little sea slug and they identified the siphon right over here. And gently with their fingers, they touched the siphon. And with the first touch, the sea slug kind of freaked out and it withdrew the siphon and the gills almost in like a defensive mechanism. So they then allowed the sea slug to kind of, you know, calm down, go back to quote unquote homeostasis. And they went ahead and they repeated the stimulus. So they touched the siphon again. And once again, they got a reaction. And what they saw over time is if they consistently just touched the siphon, um, the sleeve saw quickly learned that there wasn't any fear for its life. So over time, it started to have a lesser and lesser response, almost like it was ignoring the stimulus that it was exposed to. So it was becoming habituated. It was becoming used to that particular stimulus. And it was almost like it was ignoring it because it wasn't giving a reaction, thereby allowing it to focus on other uh, simulations or other responses um, that might be occurring in its environment. And it turns out that this habituation can be done by going over to the presynaptic axons. And what happens over here is that with repeated stimulation that doesn't cause any type of um, harm to the organism and doesn't really warrant a response, we see that the presynaptic axon terminals will start inactivating their calcium channels. Now, why do we care about this? Because if we inactivate our calcium channels, then we start diminishing or lowering the amount of neurotransmitter that's released, which means that we limit the communication between the pre- and postsynaptic neurons. Thereby, we reduce the effector that we initially saw with the first stimulus. <laughs> 
Another item that they saw when they were doing their experiments is the fact of sensation. Sensation is basically when you see an increase in the response with a gentle stimulus after being exposed to a strong stimulus. Hmm, how are we going to explain that? Well, when they did their experiments with the sea slug, what they did, and this is a horrible experiment, but you know, I guess it's all in the name of science. They basically took a little um, electric probe and they touched it to the skin of the tail of the sea slug. So they basically gave it a little electrical shock. And as you can imagine, the sea slug went crazy. It just withdrew all its gills and the siphons and it was just in a very almost like hurled uh, protective position and they allowed the sea slug to kind of calm down and then what they did is instead of giving it a strong stimulus they went back to a very gentle stimulus which was literally just physically touching the tail and it seemed like the sea slug was still raw with emotions because its response to the gentle Stimulus was even more exaggerated than that with the strong um, electric little shock that it initially received. So it's almost like it was more aware and it therefore was able to have the more exaggerated response. So how do we describe that from a physiological aspect? Well, we go ahead and we take a look at what's happening within the axons. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our presynaptic axons and what we see happening here is because the first stimulus was so detrimental to the sea slug we see that when we take a look at the chain of the release of the different um, neurotransmitters ions and receptors and all that other good stuff one thing that's going to jump out is the fact that they increased their calcium influx and by increasing the amount of calcium that was dedicated to that synaptic connection, it actually went ahead and made the neurons more aware because it allowed for a higher amount of neurotransmitter to be released. It's almost like it had a shouting or amplifying effect to say to be alert because something might be coming that could be detrimental to the system. Um, a good example that I can give you or an example that I think is good that you can kind of think about is if you've ever had it that um, maybe it is late at night, you are lying in your bed, you're trying to sleep and you know it's nice and quiet around you so like the TV is off, there's no music playing, you're just about to doze off and then you hear a loud bang. Um, so hopefully we'll go and we'll kind of investigate what's happening and hopefully it's just something as stupid as something fell over, nothing serious. So we go ahead and we crawl back in bed and what we might notice is that before when we thought we were surrounded by complete silence, now we can hear every single slight noise that's out there. So we might be hearing like the little crickets that are right outside our window or you might be hearing the humming of some of the electronics that are around you. These are all noises that were there before but our brain was ignoring them. And it's only when we become sensitized to the fact that we have had a very strong stimulus that kind of shook us awake and allowed us to release more calcium in those presynaptic terminals that we became much more aware of the lesser stimuli that were always there. And then our last slide for chapter seven is going to be dedicated to memory. Now, it turns out that repetition is key if you're trying to memorize. And part of that is because we have the hippocampus that is involved in converting our short term into our long term memories. And if it's long term, what we see happening or enough time has been dedicated to the memory, it will actually get stored in the cerebrum. And the longer it gets stored, the more effective it is at retrieving it. And part of that is because the neurons will go ahead and dedicate synaptic space to that particular fact or um, skill that you're trying to memorize. Um, part of that has to do with the fact that when we take a look at the communication between the axons and the synaptic um, <coughs> sorry, in the synaptic pattern, we see that once again, we're going to have high levels of calcium. And hopefully we see the correlating trend that the more calcium we have dedicated to an area within the neurons, the easier it is to kind of have a response. And in this case, the easier it is to kind of jive up the memory of the particular mammals. 
Now go ahead and take a look at the illustration that's at the bottom. And what you can see happening is you can see communication between the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell. And what we see happening is that in the case of memory, whenever this relationship is repeatedly utilized, we have high levels of glutamate that's released between the pre and the postsynaptic cells. But more importantly, because you have the massive amounts of glutamate being released, it's gonna cause an overdose or extremely high levels of calcium to be released and saturated within the postsynaptic cell, allowing us to retrieve that short-term memory and convert it into a long-term memory. So if you're really interested in learning something and memorizing it more importantly, the easiest thing to do is to just repeat it over and over again. And that is why if you wanna effectively memorize and learn, obviously, but if you wanna memorize items in a lecture, the best thing to do is to read the textbook, to go over to the PowerPoints, to attend your lectures, listen to the audio, and then also make your own notes, and in a perfect world, have study groups where you discuss the material again. Because the more you expose your neurons to it, the more calcium is dedicated to it, um, the more of a synaptic connection you make, so the easier it is it will be to retrieve during the rest of your lifetime. All right, everybody, that is the end of chapter seven. Um, so as always, I do wanna encourage you to go ahead and send me an email or use the discussion post if you have any uh, questions, comments, and concerns. And we will meet soon for our next chapter. Enjoy the rest of your day.